We are people of the word of God. Amen. If you have your Bibles, open up with me to 1 Thessalonians. I would just like to welcome uh, colleagues in ministry, uh, David and Shelley Fisher. If you would just give us a wave. They pastored many years in Massachusetts, now travel and do evangelism. We're glad you're here this morning. Amen. We have been working through Bible doctrines. We understand and know the importance of knowing what God's word has truly said. Amen. Uh, I'm reminded of a story of a, of a church that was looking for a pastor. And um, so they interviewed the pastor and uh, they, were, they, they asked the pastor to just give them uh, their, his understanding of what the Bible says. And this is what he said. He says, why don't you tell, well, they asked, why don't you tell us the story of the prodigal son? And the young preacher said, fine. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus who went down to Jericho by night and he fell upon stony ground and the thorns choked him half to death. The next morning, Solomon and his wife, Gomorrah, came by and carried him down to the ark by Moses to take care of him. But as he was going through the eastern gate into the ark, he caught his hair in a limb and hung there for 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards did hunger. And the ravens came and fed him. The next day the three wise men came and carried him down to the boat dock, and he caught a ship to Nineveh. And when he got there, he found Delilah sitting on the wall, and he said, Chuck her down, boys, chuck her down. And they said, how many times shall we chuck her down? Till seven times seven, 490 times. And she burst asunder in their midst, and they picked up 12 baskets of the leftovers. And in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be? Some of you uh, don't get it because you don't know your Bible. Um, but um, uh, the committee chairman suddenly interrupted the young minister and said to the remainder of the committee, fellows, I think we ought to ask the church to call him as our minister. He is awfully young, but he sure knows his Bible. <laughs> That's why we need to know Bible doctrine, and we need to know what the Bible has to say. Can you say amen? amen. This morning, I want to talk to you about what I believe, according to biblical prophecy, according to the Word of God, the next event on God's prophetic timetable, I believe, is the rapture of the church, is the soon coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. It could happen at any moment. It could happen at every, any time. We do not know the day or the hour, but we do know according to Scripture that he will come suddenly and that without warning. And you and I are always called to live our life ready for the coming of Jesus. Can you say amen? amen? The rapture of the church is the first phase of a two-phase part of the second coming of the Lord. We believe according to scripture that Jesus, the church of Jesus Christ, we will be caught up together with the Lord and the dead in Christ will also rise and we will be the rapture will set in motion a seven year period what we know as the tribulation untold horror untold uh, uh, such judgment upon a Christ rejecting world when you think of the condition of our world right now isn't the world in pretty tough shape when you think of the condition of our world right now, imagine what it will be like when the church is taken out of the world. We are the light of the world. We are the salt of the earth. The church has a preserving influence over our culture. Things are bad, but let me tell you, when the church is taken out of the way, there will be no restraining influence in our sick, sinful, Christ-rejecting world. So you know what will happen? All hell will break loose. A world uh, in, in some places, in some pockets of our society, a world that has no desire for God, a, word that, a world that does not want God in its schools, it does not want God in, in its communities, does not want God even in its country, has taken the name of God out of every, every part of our, our society. The world will get what they want. They will get a world without the church without the saving or the, or the preserving influence of the gospel. And then we will see something in this world 
that has never been seen, tribulation that will come upon the world for seven years. At the end of the seven years, Jesus Christ will come back and that will be, he will be seen by everyone. The first coming or the first phase of his second coming, we will see him. In the second phase, the whole world will see him. The first phase will be secretly, so to speak. The second phase will be very openly. Maybe you have seen uh, this commercial on TV promoting a Bible teacher's book on the rapture where suddenly people will disappear. Suddenly people will be removed from this planet and they, we call that the rapture. I want you to open up with me to 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Do you know that the Bible, for every time there's a prophecy of Christ's first coming, what we are about to celebrate in less than 30 days, Christmas, for every prophecy about Jesus' first coming in his birth, there are eight prophecies about his second coming. Think about that for one moment. All of the prophecies that lead up to Jesus coming to be born, the Son of God to be born in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago, for every one of those prophecies, eight times more for the second coming. How many of you know if God fulfilled every prophecy to the T in the fullness of time Jesus came, how many of you know that there, every prophecy will be fulfilled and God will confirm his word about the second coming? Jesus is coming back. I know we have heard it so often. I know the church has heard it by preachers and teachers and evangelists, and sometimes it's been overly sensationalized. Sometimes it's been talked about, and, and people have tried to identify all of what's going on in the world and try to connect the dots biblically and say this one is the Antichrist, that one's the Antichrist. Throughout history, People have tried to identify these characters. But you know what? Although it's been sensationalized, although people have lost sight of it, it is still a fact that Jesus is coming back, and he can come back at any time. And the signs of the times are more clearer than ever that Jesus is coming back. Eight times more prophecy. In the New Testament alone, there, there are every, for every 30 verses, or after every 30 verses, there is a, 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 a mention of the second coming of Jesus. Think about that. One chapter, on average, one, for every chapter, there is a reference in the New Testament to the coming of Jesus. How many of you know that is significant? Yes, is. Anytime that the, in the Word of God where you see a double reference, where you see a repetition, that is God's emphasis, and that means you and I are to be aware can you say amen? First Thessalonians, I want the word of God to speak for itself. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you, by what? By the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of an archangel and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus shall we always be with the Lord. Sometimes we stop there, but there's one more verse. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Comfort one another with these words. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we have what has been uh, come to be known as the rapture of the church. The word rapture means a catching away, a snatching away. The word rapture refers to the church of Jesus Christ, true believers rising to meet 
Jesus in the ear at his second coming. The rapture is a sudden snatching away of the people of God. What is the importance of this doctrine? Just a couple of thoughts I'd like to share with you. It is a call to encouragement. It is a call to encouragement. The word of God tells us, therefore, comfort one another with these words. What was the comfort? Because some had died and they thought they missed it. Those who were alive were unsure. But the point the apostle Paul is making, those who die won't miss it. Those who are alive won't miss him. Jesus is coming whether you're dead or alive. You remember in the old wild, wild west, the old shows, you would see the posters wanted of a, of a criminal, wanted dead or alive. The good news, you and I are going to go up in the rapture whether we're alive or whether we're in the ground. We will go to meet the Lord and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And we are to encourage one another. Think about it this morning. What a glorious event. In the twinkling of an eye, the Bible said, at the trumpet of God, you and I shall be changed. We shall meet the Lord, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Is there anybody happy about Jesus coming back? Is there anybody happy about the prospect of the coming of the Lord? Hallelujah. Listen, we will finally be free from sin. Sin will no longer have authority or control over us. We will be finally free from suffering. No more suffering, no more pain, no more heartache. We will finally be free from Satan. No more devil to tempt us, no more devil to attack us. We will forever be in the presence of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Some debate about the rapture. Will it be pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib? I still believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be around for seven years when the wrath of God is poured out upon the world that is rejected. And the Bible says we have not been appointed unto wrath, but we have been appointed unto salvation. We know that no man knows the day or the hour when Jesus will come back. Back in 1988... I had graduated from Bible college, and it was before Victory Church was started in uh, 1989. And I was serving at my home church, North Providence Assembly of God, which now is Restoration Church. My pastor was away, and he, he asked me to do a Bible study on a particular Wednesday night. And he gave me the topic because at that time there was this book that had been written by a mathematician... And, uh, you know, kind of kind of got some notoriety and uh, some church people were asking questions because the title of the book was 88 Reasons Why Jesus Will Come Back in 1988. So my pastor wanted me to uh, deal with that and do a Bible study on the coming of the Lord. Um, it's pretty easy because the Bible tells us clearly no man knows the day nor the hour that Jesus will come back. All we are instructed to do is to watch, to be ready, and to be aware, and to be prayerful because we do not know when Jesus will come back. Well, as you know, 1988 came and went, so this mathematician, he wrote another book, 89 Reasons Why Jesus Will Come Back in 1989. I don't know if he's still writing books. I don't know if people are still foolish enough to buy those books. But let me tell you, time is come and gone, and Jesus hasn't come back. But let not that cause you to lose sight of the fact that Jesus will return. We don't know the day nor the hour, but we are called to be sober and vigilant. Turn with me to uh, Titus. Titus, just a few books over to to the right. Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2, look what the word of God says. Again, I love to read the word of God and I love the word of God to speak for itself. The word has more power and authority than the words of any man. Verse 11, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodly and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. Look at verse 13. How should we live? Looking for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
That's how we're to live. The grace of God has appeared to us. God has touched our hearts, but it's also caused us to look for a blessed hope. What's the blessed hope? It's the appearing of Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? Amen. We are not to set dates with foolish and outlandish speculations, but we are to look to that hope, that blessed hope. When everything around us seems out of control, our nation, the nations of the world, our own personal world, God is still in control. As crazy as it is in the world, brothers and sisters, we are called to be the salt of the earth, the light of the world, to do our best to influence culture. We are to pray for revival, believe for revival, believe for salvation. But let me tell you, this world is not going to get better. I hate to tell you that this morning. This world is only going to get worse. The Bible tells us that in the last days there will be perilous times. We need a revival so that as many people as possible can come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. But this world will never become a utopia. It will never become a perfect world until Jesus comes back. And that is after this, in the second phase, after the tribulation. And the Bible says he will set up a kingdom, a thousand-year millennial. And we'll talk more about that in the future but God is still in control everything even in our crazy world God is still in control of the Middle East he still has his hand on the nation of Israel let the nations rage but God has his hand on the nation of Israel and we are called to pray for the peace of Jerusalem that tiny sliver of land no bigger than the city the, the state of New Jersey has a special place in the plan and the prophetic purpose of God for the last days it all started there and the bible tells us it will end in Jerusalem it will not end in Lagos it will not end in, uh, in in Italy it will not end in New York City or LA it'll end in a small little city of Jerusalem and all that we see in this world is moving into being moved into place by a sovereign hand of God. Jesus said in Luke 21 verse 26, men's hearts will be failing them for fear of the expectation of those things which are coming upon the earth. Don't you find that right now? Maybe you and I might feel fearful at times, but I see people in this world that are so fearful, they, don't, they can't comprehend what is happening in this world. I see it as a, a strategic opportunity to share the faith. To share the gospel. I was sharing the gospel with someone just about a a week or two ago discussing uh, what's going on in our world. And let me tell you, we have a hope that the world does not have. They cannot comprehend. They cannot see a way out. But we have a way out, and it is through the blessed hope of Jesus Christ. You see, we have a hope in God this morning. People without Christ, if their hopes are based upon uh, the political situation or the uh, very tenuous agreements between nations or if it's the condition of the economy or the, uh, the uncertainty of life. There's no hope. There's only a hope through Christ. Paul said in this passage of Scripture, therefore, comfort one another with these words. We have good news. No matter how bad it gets on earth, We're going to be with Jesus. No matter how bad things get, there is a hope that we have to be with Jesus forever and ever. Do you know that the early church, that was their constant hope? Because they lived under an oppression, under a persecution. They lived in a culture where they were were so persecuted, imprisoned, and even killed for their faith. So they were looking for that hope. They were looking for that hope that Jesus was going to come back. My question to you and I, have we become so comfortable and complacent that we no longer have that hope or that expectation for Jesus to come back? A second thought I'd like to share with you. The rapture or the coming of Jesus is a call to encouragement, but it's also a call to watchfulness. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 24. Again, to look and see how the scriptures so clearly speak to this topic. Matthew chapter 24, verse 36. But of that day and hour, no one knows. No, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. 
For as the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken, the other will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and the other left. What does the word of God say? Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore you also, you also be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not expect him. Look at the challenge or the injunction to watch, Jesus said, to be ready. Here we see a picture of the rapture. What does the Bible say? There will be two men in the field. One will be taken and the other left. There will be two women grinding of wheat and in the harvest. And the Bible says one will be taken and the other left. There will be a separation between good and evil. There will be a separation between those who know Jesus and those who do not know the Lord. There will be a clear separation. We see in this parable Jesus is telling, he, it just speaks of life going on as normal. Is there anything wrong with eating and drinking? No. Is there anything wrong with marrying or working? No. The point of this parable is Jesus is saying that life is going to go on as usual. In other words, people will be going on and living their life regardless of what's going on around them. And all of a sudden, there will be a separation. Jesus said in verse 42, watch therefore. Verse 44, therefore you also be ready. Turn with me to Mark chapter 13. My hope that is if the rapture were to happen right now, nobody would be left in church. Hello? You better run to this altar if you're left behind. Cry out for mercy. There's been times when We've maybe canceled a church service or somebody got mixed up in their schedule and they came to the church parking lot and they didn't see anybody there and they wondered, did I miss the rapture? (laughs) Don't miss, don't miss it. Mark 13, verse 32. Here it is again. But of that day and hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the son, but only the father. Take heed. Listen listen to the words of Jesus. Watch and pray. For you do not know when the time is. It is like a man going to a far country who left his house, gave authority to his servants and to each one his work, and commanded the doorkeepers to watch. Watch, therefore, for you do not know them when the master of the house is coming in the evening at midnight or at the crowing of the rooster or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say to you, I say to all, watch, watch. See, there must be an awareness that the Lord may come at any time without warning. This alone should stir us from our lethargy. This should stir us from our complacency and our compromise. You see, we are called to live our lives in the light of his coming. That means we ought to evaluate our heart's motives, our priorities, our plans. You know, a lot of times we can do things But God is not just looking at our actions. He's looking at the motives of our heart. Sometimes it's easy to do certain things in life, in church, in church ministry, when other people see us, when other people applaud us. But do we do it when no one's watching, realizing that the eyes of the Lord are upon everything? The Bible says, and he sees the good and the evil. 
How do we live our lives? Are we, out, are we to live our lives one way in public, but be differently in private? No, we ought to be the same person, and that speaks to the issue of integrity, and that speaks to the issue of character. Turn with me to 2 Peter. Again, I want to let the word of God just speak for itself. Hear the word of the Lord this morning in Jesus' name. 2 Peter chapter 3. Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and the commandments of us, uh, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? Listen, Peter is prophesying In the last days, there will be scoffers. There will be people who will say, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. So so that's a prophetic fulfillment. That was prophesied. We're hearing that people say that today. Where is the promise of his coming? And they begin to live their lives as though Jesus is never coming back. Verse 5, for this they willfully forget, that by the word of the Lord the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of water and in the water by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth, listen, which now exist are kept in store by the same word, reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Let me go down to verse 11. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of the Lord, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells, Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless. What a challenge. Peter is saying, if these things are going to happen, what kind of lives ought we to live? I like to read it from the New American Standard. What manner of persons, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? The Amplified Version says, what kind of people ought you to be in the meantime in holy behavior? That is in a pattern of daily life that sets you apart as a believer in all godliness, displaying profound reverence toward our awesome God. My question to you this morning, would you go to some places that you go to now that you wouldn't if Jesus was to be coming back in this very moment. If you knew Jesus was coming back, would you partake of the things that you now partake of? It doesn't matter what culture says. Culture says a lot of things are okay when God's word has already said it's not okay. I am just just overwhelmed by the thought of how our culture has been on a steady decline and has begun to call evil good and good evil. It's mind-boggling to think how we have allowed what used to be taboo, what used to be wrong 20, 30, 40 years ago, now we call it acceptable. And not only that, but we promote it. You say the Bible doesn't say anything about what type of music I should listen to. It doesn't, but it also says in Philippians chapter 4, whatsoever is pure, lovely, good report, virtuous, and praiseworthy, think on these things. So there it does make a difference what you live or what you listen to because what is imputed into your mind or inputted into your mind starts to think in your, your heart and your spirit and you start to live it out. The Bible says, as a man thinketh, so is he. 
If you hear lyrics of music that tear down women and that, and that glamorize sex outside of marriage and glamorize all things that are ungodly, then that will get in your spirit and you will begin to lower your standards and begin to think you can do whatever you, can, you want to do without consequence. You might say the Bible doesn't say anything about drinking alcohol. No, but it does have a lot to say about drunkenness. Proverbs 20, chapter 20, verse 1 says, Wine is a mocker. Intoxicating drink arouses brawling, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. All of us, all of us, I'm sure, have in our families those who have been greatly and negatively affected by alcohol. Hmm. How can we be so foolish to think it's okay to dabble with something that has caused bondages and addictions that has destroyed lives, destroyed families, and destroyed people's liver? You might say that um, it doesn't matter what a man or woman does with his or her body. It's their own business. But God has something to say about that. He says, flee sexual immorality. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, the word of God says this, every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. And do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. You've been bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which really belong to God. You see, we might pick and choose what is right and wrong according to the word, world and according to culture, but we always must take the word of God as our standard and as our guide and as what is right and wrong. Hallelujah. Sometimes we're blinded. You know, maybe you don't commit those outward sins. The Bible says some men's sins are obvious. Everybody can see them, but other sins, they're not so obvious, but they follow men to judgment. Some of you might have pride in your life and you might look down on people and you might, you might have a condescending, judgmental, and critical attitude. Some of you might come to church on Sunday morning and look so pious, but you might have lunch and you have roast pasta for lunch. That's a side dish along with roast beef. The Spirit of God might move powerfully. The Holy Ghost might touch people. People might get blessed. And I might exhort through my whole message. But I didn't have a sermon with three points, a him and a her and a benediction. And people might say after, oh, that was a, it was good today, but I like to hear the word. Well, open your ears because I'm always preaching the word. And then there are those that are real pious. Oh, I'm not getting fed anymore. I don't know about you, but I preach too long to give in to that lying spirit. Because I preach to people and I've seen their eyes. I've seen their spirit. When they first came to the church and I'm preaching, they're soaking it in. They're taking it in. They're saying amen. Good word. Good word. A couple months, a couple of years go by and they get offended. And then they talk with other people. And all of a sudden they can't receive anymore. I don't think, I I believe I became a better preacher. That same countenance that had eyes that were soaking in the word of God. They were hungry for the word of God. Now they're proud and arrogant and looking. And they're saying, I shall not be moved. I shall not be moved. And they're sitting on their blessed assurance. And God ain't pleased. God ain't, I'm just going after a few demons this morning. You just might want to separate yourself from those demons so you don't get offended. You see, careful we don't do as the religious people of Jesus' time. Jesus had the most problem with religious people. The most problem, the rebukes that he had were to the religious people. And he said, you hypocrites, you clean the outside of the dish, but inside you're full of greed and pride and self-indulgence. Amen. Can I move on now? Don't pick and choose. Don't condescend to people because you don't sin like somebody else. You might sin in worse ways. God hates pride. 
God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. You could, you could be an adulterer. You could be any kind of sinner. You could be a thief. You could be whatever. But God will give you grace if you humble yourself. If you're proud, you cannot get grace because you won't reach out to God because you won't think you need it. And that is a, that is a, a bad place. That is a dark place to be at. Don't pick and choose. I heard the story of a man who was traveling to another state. He went with his girlfriend to pick up a pizza that he had ordered. When he got back to the hotel, he noticed that was $6,000 in the pizza box. He didn't realize the owner, or the owner didn't realize he had put the money in that he was going to take it to the bank, but he had put it on a shelf, just hit it on the side, and the worker at the, at the pizza place picked up the wrong box and gave this man a pizza box with $6,000. How would you like to get your pizza served that way? The man being honest, he brought back the money to the pizza place. The owner was so grateful. He wanted to take a picture. He wanted to post it on social media. He wanted to call the local news station. The man says, no, no. And the pizza says, wow, you are so humble. The man said, no, this woman is my girlfriend. My wife's at home. You see, this man was honest with money, but he was dishonest with his marriage. He had integrity in one area. Oh, I would never do that, but he was cheating on his wife. God help us. You see, there is a call to watchfulness that is not an empty warning, it is essential. Why? Because we're living in a world that everything, everything is geared against us. Everything. You have to understand we're living in a sinful, sick, perverted, wicked, evil world. That is the truth. That is what the word of God, that is, that is how the word of God assesses the, the, the condition of mankind. There is none righteous, no, not one. All seek their own. Everyone is turned aside. We're all like sheep that have gone astray. Only through the blood of Jesus can we come back. Only through the blood of Jesus can we be maintained whole or maintain a place of, of wholeness. Everything in the world is geared against us. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, John the apostle says, Love not the world. Neither the things that are in the world. For the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life are all of the world. It's not of the Father, and they all pass away. When the Word of God says, love not the world, it's not talking about God's creation. It's not talking about people. What the, that, uh, the reference there is talking about the systems, the culture of the world that is geared against God. Love not the world. Say no to the world. Say yes to God. Resist the devil. Submit to God. End time prophecy was never given to satisfy your curiosities, but to prepare us. To prepare us. Jesus said, because evil will abound, the love of many will grow cold. That's very real in our world. It's very evident even in churches. Christians are growing cold. Christians are turning away from the faith. COVID reveals something to us. It made people comfortable and complacent. Now they like to go by bedside assembly of God and watch it on their iPad. Some of you didn't get that, but you can watch it later. What are we to do? How are we to live? God help us to live every day with the awareness and the readiness that he may come before we lay our head on the pillow or we might before we awake tomorrow morning. I was talking with a good Christian brother last couple of weeks and we were talking about what's going on in the world, talking about Bible prophecy, talking about end times. And he asked me this question. He says, and we know each other very well, And he says to me, do you really believe, do you really believe this could be the end? And you know, sometimes we give the answer, oh yeah, I believe it. We don't don't even think sometimes we're so spiritual, right? 
But you know what? It, it, it brought a measure of conviction, and I pray, I pray for more conviction in my life. Because what it did for me is that do I really believe that Jesus can come back today or tomorrow or in the very, very near future? Do I really believe that? And it caused me to pray, and I'm praying, God, give me more of a sense of conviction. Not, not words. Come on. We, I can melt the words as good as any of you. It, but God ain't impressed with words. He's impressed with the heart. And I say, God, give me more conviction. Give, give me more of a revelation of this truth, of this reality this morning, that Jesus can come back at any time so that my life, that my thoughts, my words, my actions might line up with the truth of God's word. See, because integrity and character is not who you are in front of people, but it's who you are when nobody's watching. Anybody can look good when people are watching, but God sees when no one's watching. God not only sees the words of your mouth, he sees the, the in, di- desires of your heart. He not only sees what you say, but he sees what you're thinking and what you're meditating upon. So that brought conviction to me. It may have bring conviction to the church. Maybe there are some of you this morning that you do not know that if Jesus was to come back, that you would go to be with the Lord. That is something you don't want to trifle with. It's not, it's not uh, you know, Black Friday sale you miss, you can wait till Cyber Monday. If you miss it, you miss it. God help me, God help us as pastors and leaders that we have such a compassion and a burden for people that our heart breaks for the lost, for people in our family that are indifferent to the gospel after 20, 30, 40 years of hearing the gospel, still indifferent. Don't be fooled. Not everyone's going to heaven. Jesus has provided a way for all who will accept him. When, when, when God judged the world because of their evil in the days of Noah, he provided an escape route. It was in the ark. The Bible says Noah was building an ark for 120 years. And not only was he building an ark, but he was a preacher, the Bible says. The Bible says that Noah was a preacher of righteousness, of right living. My God, we have a world of unrighteousness. We have a world of wickedness. But you know what? There was only one way of salvation. You were in the boat or you were not. And the door was open. There was an opportunity. Whosoever will, let him come in. Whosoever will, let him get into the ark of safety. But there came a time when when the door closed and the rains came. There was no more opportunity. But God gave the opportunity. You know what? What's so amazing is that, you know, Noah, his family, they were in the minority. Everyone else in the majority rejected the truth. They were in the minority when they got out, but how many of you know when when they got in the ark, but how many of you know when they got out of the ark, they were in the majority? Isn't it amazing that experts built the Titanic and it sunk and amateurs built the ark and it floated? What Leonardo Leonardo DiCaprio didn't know. Imagine, not even God can sink this ship. They said of the Titanic, oh, what audacity. I think sometimes God gets riled up when people make statements like that. There was only one way of safety. Today, there is only one way of safety, and that's through the cross of Jesus Christ. That's through repentance of sin and faith in the Lord, the acknowledgement that you and I cannot save ourselves. We need a Savior, and that only we can only be saved by the grace of God through Jesus Christ. He's the only one who provided for the forgiveness of our sins. I don't know where you're at this morning, but there will be one that will be taken And one will be left. You do not want to be left behind. You do not want to miss this opportunity, the blessed hope. I close with this illustration. I read about a pastor's wife who ran a nursing home. She always got high marks and passed with flying colors when the state came for an inspection. People started to wonder if she knew somebody in the state inspector's office that would tip her off and would warn her. 
because she never got a mark, bad mark, she never got a violation. When she was asked the question, how she always did so well, she said this. She said she always conducted the affairs of the nursing home with an expectation that the state would stop by at any time. The question this morning, do you and I conduct our lives with the expectation that Jesus could return at any time? Would you stand together with me this morning? I'm going to ask for the worship team to come back. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. God just added a divine exclamation point to this message through a prophetic word and a, and a, and a burden of the soul, of the burden of the heart of God. I want to ask you right now, just, just to, if you're not sure or if you want to make sure, just quickly move out of your seat. Just come to these altars. We're going to have a time of prayer. Some of you have play, been playing church. Some of you have been in and out. Now's not the time. We're living in desperate times. We're living in, 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 in perilous times. We need to make sure we're right with God. Would you just quickly move out of your seat. Come to these altars as they begin to sing. Come on, let's, let's heed the warning this morning. Let's heed the warning to prepare, to be ready, to make a choice, to repent of our sins this morning. Amen. Amen. As they begin to sing, you just come. that need to come. There's others that need to make it right with God this morning. Come on, today is the day of salvation. Come on, respond to God. Trust God this morning. Put your faith in Jesus this morning. You deserve the glory.